making this uh, invitation uh, once more and uh, of course to Dean uh, Malik uh, who is uh, hosting this, uh, this lecture and uh, uh, to uh, of course um, first and foremost uh, to uh, Dr. Goga Sabahwal uh, you know, uh, 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 animating you know, this um, uh, budding university and, um, and uh, really uh, being open-minded enough to invite pilgrims see, from uh, all over the world because uh, uh, I must say that um, uh, Anjana has been talking about this uh, conference with, which was uh, really um, um, uh, really then let's say a decisive moment uh, not only for, for this history of the university but also for me because it was um, uh, not exactly the, the first time that I came to, to India but um, uh, the first time that um, I had this chance of uh, uh, meeting uh, so many uh, scholars from all over the world you know, in the um, Indian context so I'm, I'm really uh, grateful and, and deeply moved to, to be here again because uh, I was hoping to, to be able to uh, uh, stay a bit longer but um, duty calls and I have to, to be back to, to Paris for, for, for an important meeting. Um, so, um, uh, if you will allow me, I'll uh, first uh, make a, a very brief presentation of the institution I come from. Um, uh, maybe you've uh, heard about the Collège de France uh, through, um, let's say, uh, prestigious names in uh, French theory like uh, uh, Foucault, you know, Barthes, uh, Bourdieu, etc. You know, who are all professors at uh, Collège de France, but you may not uh, know much about the uh, working of the institution, which is rather uh, peculiar. So, as you can see from the first slide, uh, this uh, institution was founded in 1530 in the uh, 16th century by the King of France, you know, Francis I. And uh, this date, 16th century, uh, will bring us back to, um, let's say, the uh, heyday of uh, the uh, European Renaissance uh, period and its uh, uh, humanistic spirit. And uh, the Collège de France can be really said to be representative of this uh, humanistic uh, uh, spirit. And um, the uh, motto that you have here in Latin is uh, Docet Omnia, which means uh, everything is uh, uh, being taught. Um, uh, the, the College of France teaches everything. Um, um, intent, well, I mean, um, um, meaning that um, uh, it teaches everything that the Sorbonne didn't teach at that time. Uh, if anybody of you has been to Paris and to the Latin Quarter, um, uh, you would have seen the Collège de France standing right beside the, uh, the Sorbonne. And so, in a way, I mean, they were, they, they, um, in medieval times and uh, Renaissance times, they were, uh, let's say, uh, competitors. Uh, and the Collège de France was founded as a sort of alternative to the Sorbonne, which was very much uh, under you know, the uh, influence of the, uh, the church. You see? And the Collège de France claims uh, to have uh, started uh, new teachings in topics that uh, weren't uh, taught in uh, at the Sorbonne, like um, uh, Arabic, and uh, much later on. Um, no, I, I can do it myself. So, um, so um, the course is um, um, the first thing to uh, keep in mind is that uh, it's not a university, uh, unlike the Sorbonne, you see. So it doesn't work like a, like a university, uh, it doesn't work in terms of departments, but in terms of chairs. Okay? So you've got about uh, 50 chairs, uh, about uh, half in uh, the hard sciences, so-called hard sciences, like mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, um, and uh, another half in uh, arts, you know, um, history, philosophy, uh, social sciences, etc. And so each chair is independent from, uh, from the others and uh, um, has to uh, animate a whole uh, discipline, a whole field of uh, knowledge. Um, so um, the, uh, 
um, this is um, a glimpse of, of, a of our assembly room where, where I'll be on Sunday. You know, please uh, think about me here on Sunday because uh, I'm going back to Paris, especially for, for this um, uh, for this assembly, which takes place only three times a year. So it's important that we're all there. Uh, because um, uh, otherwise I would have thought of uh, flying directly uh, from India to Kuala uh, Lumpur where I'm uh, supposed to attend a, a conference but I have to go back to Paris, you know, especially for, for this uh, assembly. So the uh, Collège de France is run in a perfectly collegial way that is we are perfectly independent of any power, you know, whether it be economic or, or political uh, and this has been the functioning of Collège de France since its, its very beginning uh, because it's absolutely essential and vital for us to um, uh, keep a perfect independence in uh, uh, spirit and uh, in our uh, choices <coughs> of teaching. Um, so um, you have uh, about, as I said, 50 chairs which are permanent. That is, when you are elected on one chair, you're supposed to stay there until you're 70, you know, so it's uh, uh, tantamount to a sort of uh, uh, life on chair, you know, but you have uh, a number of uh, annual chairs with which would, uh, uh, on which you know, uh, scholars would be uh, invited only for, for one year on those uh, rather, you know, more specific topics like uh, technological innovation, sustainable development, etc. Um, and so, uh, now just a few words about the uh, various missions of the, uh, of the Collège de France. Uh, so, of course, the Collège de France, although it's not a university, the first mission is to teach. Okay? Uh, and each chair, uh, being occupied by one professor, is supposed to uh, teach, um, as you have the formula here, knowledge in the making, that is, uh, each professor is absolutely free to teach whatever he likes, well, of course, in his own discipline, uh, but um, he's, uh, he doesn't have to, uh, let's say, um, uh, respond to any um, uh, demand from any curriculum, you know, uh, since we're not uh, teaching uh, students, uh, especially. Uh, so uh, we were quite uh, free in our choices, but, um, but the condition is that uh, we have to renew our teaching every year, so uh, that makes uh, for a lot of, uh, of research work. And uh, you have here a quotation from uh, the French philosopher Merleau Ponty. Um, so another uh, specific character of the Collège de France is that uh, the lectures are absolutely open to the public, meaning that you don't have to produce any evidence of um, uh, qualification, degrees or anything, and they are free, so you don't have to pay anything. Anyone can barge in, you know, attend any lectures that uh, she or he likes. Uh, but uh, the counterpart is that the College of France doesn't deliver uh, degrees, right? Uh, so, um, it's very, very much an institution uh, which uh, represents uh, the spirit of uh, uh, public service in a way. You know, we were, were addressing you know, all our fellow citizens, uh, whether in France or, or beyond, uh, or even to, to uh, the whole uh, world. And uh, so, the uh, ritual of an election at uh, Collège de France starts with this uh, inaugural lecture and I wasn't able to uh, choose this uh, picture but you, uh, uh, the, the book on the top happens to be my inaugural lecture which is entitled uh, Does China Think? Mm -hmm. This is a real question. Um, and, um, and here again, yeah, I didn't choose this picture but you can see me you know, in my inaugural. Um, and, um, uh, the, um, also um, uh, enlarges see, its uh, mission to uh, the uh, international scale by organizing uh, symposiums and uh, conferences uh, with guest lecturers from abroad. So we have an active you know, uh, invitation policy here. And you have a list 
of um, uh, institutions abroad with which the Credit of France has um, some um, uh, MOUs. And you can see immediately that India is not on it. You know. But I'm working at it very, very actively. That's why you know, uh, you'll see more of me. <laughs> Uh, because I, I really like you know, to, um, uh, by the way, the, um, uh, the MOU with the University of Tokyo I was uh, responsible for, and I've just uh, managed to uh, have an MOU um, uh, signed between the Collège de France and Fudan University uh, in Shanghai, in China. So I'm just hoping you know, to uh, do the same with some Indian University. So you have this global network here. Um, so the uh, second uh, mission of the Collège de France is, of course, uh, related to the teaching, uh, since it's um, you know you have to teach your research in the making. And um, the Collège de France is not only um, this um, institution for teaching, but it has a lot of uh, uh, laboratories, especially scientific laboratories, and you can uh, see one of those uh, here. And also uh, a number of libraries. Uh, you have a general library, but also the specialized libraries. And uh, you have here a sample of books coming from the uh, Oriental Library, you know, with some Chinese uh, books and uh, manuscripts. Uh, there's also a department in Indian studies and Japanese studies, Korean studies as well. Um, so here you have um, uh, a glimpse of the um, um, scientific building here, and well, I mean, all, all these data are of minor importance to, to you, but uh, the Collège de France is also related to other research institutions in France, like the CNRS, which is the uh, National Centre for Scientific Research. And so the laboratories, uh, whether they be on the scientific side or the art side, uh, also include uh, some PhD and uh, post. Uh, doctoral students from all over France and all over the world as well. Uh, so here you have a um, you know, um, description of the uh, libraries. Um, mm -hmm. And this is an important part of our institutional life, it's the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And I recommend it not for the food, but for the, the, for the view that you have uh, all over uh, Paris. Um, and so the third mission would be the uh, dissemination of knowledge and Research. So you have here some samples of the uh, publications of the uh, Collège de France, um, and um, uh, for the past uh, decade or so, uh, all the teachings and the uh, let's say intellectual production of the Collège de France uh, are available online. Uh, you just have to uh, check the uh, Collège de France website, and you'll find. So uh, practically all the um, uh, teachings in audio uh, and video uh, format, uh, so you can uh, uh, follow any, any teachings that you are, you're interested in. And most uh, lectures are uh, available also in English, and in my case they are also available in Chinese. So, um, in, um, so this. Uh, Let's say uh, worldwide dissemination of knowledge is really part of, uh, of the uh, mission of the Collège de France. This is the newsletter. Um, there are some periodicals that, that are also available online, uh, most of them free. You, know, um, you can download them and uh, absolutely free. Um, and um, so, well, we end up on the um, on the glimpse of the central courtyard here with the uh, statue of Champollion, you know, who was the French scholar who managed to decipher the uh, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, so, so welcome to, to all um, uh, for the uh, um, to the Collège de France where you can uh, continue Paris. And uh, now uh, we move on to some Chinese characters uh, that some of you uh, might be able to, to read. Um, so, um, my um, idea today 
uh, was to, uh, let's say, have a critical view of um, that uh, all idea of uh, Chinese uh, centrality and Chinese uh, universality. Uh, of course, uh, you are all aware that um, uh, of this paradox, you see, that uh, the, the idea itself of universality uh, is uh, renowned for being anything but universal. You know, um, uh, of course, we're more uh, acquainted with, um, let's say, the uh, European Enlightenment uh, idea of, of universality, which has been uh, amply challenged. But China had its own uh, idea, its own universality, and uh, this idea was inseparable from a certain idea of uh, Chinese civilization, uh, with um, uh, with um, uh, uh, sort of uh, central uh, nucleus, you see, uh, which uh, corresponds to the first uh, word drawn. Uh, and this center is supposed to diffuse civilization uh, upon, upon surrounding regions. So the graph here of, uh, of um, this uh, character meaning uh, middle or center uh, was originally uh, a target, you see, um, transpersed by, by, a, by an arrow here. Yeah. So that, that means that uh, uh, you know, you, you hit, you know, sort of right uh, into the center. And uh, we should not forget that uh, China uh, portrayed itself um, as the uh, uh, middle kingdom, you know, Guo, meaning the, uh, the country, the country of the, the middle or the central country, um, down to, um, let's say, uh, early times or even more into modern times. Uh, so uh, if you are in any way uh, familiar uh, with the uh, uh, history of China, uh, I will recall that um, uh, the reality of imperial power was established you know, um, in this um, conventional date of uh, 221 BC that is in the 3rd century uh, before the Common Era, uh, when uh, this um, dynasty Qin, which by the way uh, gave its uh, European name to China, Qin, maybe in China, um, uh, first you know, centralized you know, the, uh, the Chinese space and uh, gave way shortly after that to uh, the uh, Han Empire. Uh, which lasted four, four centuries, between the uh, second century BC to uh, the second century um, AD. And so the reality of this imperial power, uh, which was based on an increasingly uh, sophisticated bureaucratic and administrative organization, uh, superimposed itself uh, upon this representation of the power of a soul, or a soul unique ruler, uh, which would be uh, this word here, uh, that is uh, the son of heaven. Uh, you have the other word, uh, which means uh, the child or uh, the son. And uh, here you have this uh, important word, tian, uh, uh, which means uh, heaven. And you will see, without even knowing a single word of Chinese, that uh, uh, this is a recurring word in all these uh, expressions here. Um, so, uh, the Son of Heaven uh, was this incarnation of the power which was both uh, mystical and uh, cosmological in the way that it uh, sort of was shining outwards and uh, was supposed to transform the beings which uh, submitted to, to this power. So for more than uh, 2,000 years, you see starting from the 3rd century uh, BC onwards, uh, which by the way, you know, since we're in Indian context, you see uh, uh, we're corresponded, if I'm not uh, wrong, you know, to uh, a 
Chopin's brain, you see, um, uh, down to, uh, let's say, the early 20th century, uh, China not only considered itself uh, the center of the world, I mean, that, 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 that's quite banal, I mean, everyone, you know, uh, uh, starting from the Greeks, you see, would consider you know, themselves uh, the center of the world, but very modestly, you know, China considered itself as the world, okay? I mean, <laughs> It wasn't contemporary with being the center of the world, but, uh, but it, it was the world. And uh, uh, this uh, self-representation uh, is encapsulated in this uh, two-character uh, uh, word, uh, which means, um, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which is pronounced in Chinese, Chinese, Tianxia, and which means uh, everything that is below heaven. So you, you uh, find again this uh, uh, character meaning heaven, and uh, xia, uh, uh, you, you have this, uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the ground level, and uh, anything that is below it would be uh, below. Uh, the uh, word meaning upwards would be, uh, would be on, on, you know, uh, above this, this level here. So all under heaven was the uh, classical, uh, way of China of uh, you know, sort of uh, naming itself, and in uh, canonical sources you have uh, numerous um, uh, illustrations of this uh, self-representation of China as the world, uh, and of course um, uh, the ruler was uh, supposed to uh, pacify. I, I quote from one of those uh, canonical sources, to pacify those who are close by and win over by his benevolence those who are far off. So you have a very powerful, you know, uh, centered uh, vision and self-representation of China, you know, from the very beginning, uh, which I believe is not exactly the, uh, the, the same picture that you get, you see, from Indian history. That's, um, uh, I think that's um, an interesting uh, difference. And um, of course, you have um, um, cosmological representations of uh, the world that is China, you know, uh, that you still have now in Peking with the altar of heaven. Uh, that is uh, the basic representation of heaven as a circle and earth as a square. Within this uh, circle, okay, um, and um, um, we'll, we'll see that here um, the uh, ritual dances that were performed uh, at the imperial court also reproduce this uh, pattern. You see, with the, with the circle and the square, you know, formed by the rows of uh, of uh, dancers. Uh, so what's uh, really interesting that is that, um, uh, albeit uh, symbolic, uh, this representation seems to have been uh, coextensive with imperial ideology for something like 2,000 years. And ever since this foundational um, uh, Han dynasty, which uh, you know, I was mentioning uh, earlier, um, which, by the way, established a sort of uh, Pax Sinica uh, in the easternmost part of the uh, Eurasian continent, uh, at the same time as a, as a Pax Romana uh, was instituted uh, by Rome, you see, uh, at its opposite end. Uh, so we can see the omnipresence of uh, what already resembled uh, a Chinese political slogan. Uh, that is the idea that, uh, you, know, you have it here, uh, it's um, an interesting, let's say, um, um, mode of um, political propaganda. Uh, this is a roof tile, actually, you know, dating back to the Han, you know, to the uh, uh, second century uh, BC. And on this roof tile, you have um, inscriptions that you have here in modern Chinese, and the inscription says, uh, only the Han Dynasty will, uh, within three 
years um, unify grandly anything that is under heaven. Okay, so Han, um, starting from the uh, second century uh, BC, already had this notion of itself as a unifying power, you know, and uh, being very strongly uh, centralized. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't forget that this uh, Han dynasty uh, also gave its name to a sort of Chinese cultural identity since um, uh, it gave its name to the language. You see, where when you learn Chinese, you learn uh, Han, you know, the, the, the language of the Han. Uh, you uh, also have uh, Han associated uh, with the dominant ethnic group. Uh, to use the, uh, you know, the uh, terminology uh, of, uh, let's say, the, the official terminology of uh, the uh, uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, and uh, by the way, I mean, this uh, dominant ethnic group is an expression that, uh, that comes from actually Stalinist uh, um, uh, categorization, but uh, that's another matter. Uh, so anyway, uh, my point is here that uh, Han really uh, conveyed to China uh, its uh, sort of uh, uh, pristine um, uh, cultural identity. And it's interesting to uh, keep in mind that uh, Indian Buddhism, you know, uh, started coming into China precisely under this uh, dynasty, you see, at the turn of the uh, Christian era, you know, right at the middle of this, uh, of this dynasty. Um, so that, that makes for, for something really um, so, um, before I uh, proceed to um, uh, my uh, topic, I would like to, yes, uh, this is the, uh, the dancers that I mentioned before, but um, uh, the same dancers uh, would uh, perform a choreography that uh, would also bear um, a political slogan. So, um, Chinese propaganda <laughs> didn't start, you see, with, with the Maoist period, it's in, yes, <laughs> sort of dates back, you know, uh, you know, to the uh, foundation of empire. And if you read the characters that were uh, thus constituted by the dancers, you read uh, Tian Xia, so uh, everything under heaven, uh, Taiping, is in great peace. Okay. So um, all these messages about the Han, you know, sort of unifying the whole world, and these dances, you see, um, uh, this um, picture, by the way, dates back to the 18th century and was brought back to uh, France by um, a Jesuit missionary. Uh, so throughout the uh, imperial history, you have these messages of uh, China, you know, sort of uh, being really powerfully centered and uh, being a center of civilization, you know, sort of, uh, 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 shining over the uh, rest of the world. And this um, symbolic uh, uh, shining force uh, also included the entire East Asian region, as uh, some of you uh, are well aware of, uh, like um, including uh, um, uh, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, etc. Uh, and all of these cultures um, have been influenced by China to different extents at, and at uh, different moments in history and uh, this influence was uh, varied whether it be in the field of um, the Chinese writing system uh, which was uh, borrowed you see, by all these uh, uh, cultural spheres, government structures, uh, bureaucratic model, uh, concepts of social hierarchy, uh, religious forms of uh, Chinese origin but also of uh, foreign uh, origin, uh, which China had assimilated, and of course uh, Buddhism, uh, which originated